Okay, in this lecture, we're going to look at uh, computer simulation of statistical mechanical systems, uh, and in particular, we're going to do Metropolis Monte Carlo systems, which uh, means we can do Metropolis Monte Carlo simulations that are basically equilibrium uh, simulations. Um, now, this is not covered extensively in the textbook, but it's a very important part of how statistical mechanics is done uh, in, uh, in the modern world, and so we're covering it in a little bit more detail. Okay, so um, here's a picture of the very start of the computational age. This is one of the very first electronic computers built in the US uh, during the Second World War, uh, probably for artillery calculations. Um, and there's the two women who are programming the, uh, the computer. Um, uh, in the Second World War, of course, women were forbidden, at least in the US, from combat duty. Um, and so they were given tasks to help in the war effort, which uh, in this case, it's programming. Okay, so there you can see that's a, a large, very large computer, but of course its computational power is small. And we will see that um, computers were used very, very early on uh, to do social mechanical calculations after, this first, after the Second World War ended, um, because it's natural to use them, because systems we're talking about have many, many particles, and they're very laborious to do any kind of real uh, calculation on by hand. So why do we bother using computer simulations? Well, um, we have in situational mechanics, as you've seen from previous courses, a kind of uh, machinery, a precise machinery, in fact, for calculating exactly what's going on in equilibrium. If we're in equilibrium states, we can actually calculate everything. Uh, and to do this, all we need to do is calculate the partition function, this thing here. Z, which is sum over all the states of the exponential of minus uh, the energy divided by kBt. So if we have an ideal gas with lots of interactions between the particles, you know, you have a particle here and a particle there and a particle there and all kinds of particles, and we know all the interactions between these two things, or they fit in all the, all the pairs uh, or triplets or whatever, uh, we can just calculate Z and then we can differentiate it and develop various things and we can calculate everything from it. Um, However, um, as you almost certainly know, in almost all systems, we really can't do that analytically. There is simply no way of doing it. Okay? You just, just, if you have 10 to the 5 particles, which is actually a fairly small number of particles, there's no way you can calculate most, for most systems you can calculate this, this integral or this, this sum. It's simply impossible. Okay. Now, you might say, well, okay, we can't calculate, calculate analytically on pieces of paper, but we could do it numerically. So let's try it numerically. And well, let's try it numerically using a brute force numerical approach, which is always the first approach when you're doing the things for the first time. Um, brute force is, is actually quite a good way of doing things. Okay, It doesn't take require much thinking. So let's just try and calculate this sum z here. Okay. Um, now, how would we do it? Well, suppose we have a system of 3D easing spins. That means a whole lot of spins like this, which are interacting with their neighbours. Okay, I'm going to draw it in 2D, but you, you know, let's think about it in 3D. So each spin interacts with uh, maybe six neighbours, for example, in 3D. Okay, um, And to get a, a real system of this, which would a real physical system, we'd like to have something which, say, would simulate a magnet. Uh, and we'd need to have uh, a cube of n by n by n of these guys, um, n, n, n. And we'd probably like n to be 100, just so we got some good statistics, a reasonable size system, which wasn't just two spins or something, which wouldn't give very good results. Um, now, if you calculate how many states there are in that system, it turns out there are two to the n to the three states. Okay. Now, for reasonable results, if we use n equals 100, this would give two to the million states, two, 10 to three times 10 to the five states. Uh, and exhaustive brute force calculation simply will not work. You can never calculate uh, this sum. It's just too many states. Okay, so you try and do things by brute force, um, you just give up. It's not going to work. Okay, so what can we do? Well, we can try and do things stochastically by doing a bit of sampling. Okay, so to do that, well, let's go to a, a much simpler problem, a much more basic problem, uh, which doesn't involve calculating partition functions and summing over states. Just suppose we didn't know what the area of a circle was. So we didn't know this formula here. Okay, didn't know A is pi r squared. 
Okay, so to calculate the area of a circle, we could just divide the circle into tiny squares. So we draw a circle and we start putting a little, little grid pattern on it, and we just count the squares. Okay, and if we count the squares, um, we can then calculate, you know, the area of a square we know, because uh, we know the area of a square, and then we can calculate what the area of a circle is, and if we divide our circle into enough squares, um, we'd be okay, we'd be able to calculate it. Okay, um, but... Uh, that works in 2D, but if you have things in n dimensions, which is what we have in stat met, because each each degree of freedom is a dimension, um, you would start to go a little bit crazy, okay? Uh, and that would be very, very difficult if you had it in 50 dimensions, for example, okay? Uh, and in most cases, we have many, many dimensions. So, you know, if we have a gas of n atoms, we have six n dimensions, three, three momentum and three... Uh, uh, configurational dimensions for each atom. That's a lot of dimensions already. Uh, and we have to calculate this thing z, which looks like that, the integral over first position x, second position, uh, first position of y, first position of z1, integral over momentum uh, of this exponential integral, which we, you know, for this for any kind of potential we might put in here. Um, and, you know, that's just going to be crazy if we have to do it that way. Um, for Even for n equals 1,000, it's going to be very, very tricky, computationally impossible. Okay, so we can't do that. Okay, uh, but we can try and do things stochastically. So let's do a, a stochastic approach in this. Okay, it's Monte, so called Monte Carlo. The word Monte Carlo is used all over the place. It just means stochastic, um, and its 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 meaning is just varies depending on what's what you're trying to simulate and how you're trying to simulate it. Okay, so let's calculate the area of a unit circle. Uh, we can just sample the space. So here we have a unit circle, okay? Uh, and we're gonna generate random numbers between zero and one and zero and one. So other obviously x, x, this is x, and that's y. And we're gonna generate random numbers only in that quadrant, okay? Between here and here and here and here. So only in this zero to one uh, quadrant. Um, and what we do is we just generate a number randomly, uniformly distributed. Uh, of x, and same for y, and if x squared plus y squared is less than 1, we know it's within our circle. So we count it as, a, as in our sum. We just add 1 to our sum. Okay, if we if we fire a, fire a bullet and it goes in there, we say, ah, that's in our sum, we'll add that 1 to it. And if we fire the bullet and it's there, uh, we say, well, we're not counting that 1. Okay, so any bullet hits there means s equals s plus 1. Okay, after n attempts, we fired n bullets, uh, we know the area of the circle is given approximately by the ratio of the number of hits S to the number of shots N uh, times the area of the circle described squared, which is 4. So that would be our answer for the area of our circle. We just take the ratio of S divided by N and multiply by 4, and that gives us the area of our area of our circle. Okay, you can think about that yourself and find out that's correct. Okay. Um, and this will give us a very good approximation for very few attempts n. So even if we fired 100 shots or something, we'd get a pretty good approximation for the area of the circle. And it turns out that in higher dimensions, it works even better. Um, and it's also very easy to implement this on, on a computer. You could easily implement this to find the area of a circle. Okay, now of course, we already know what the area of the circle is, so we don't need to do that. But if we didn't, this would be a, a reasonable way of doing it. Okay. Now let's try and apply this to a stat mech system. Okay, we're going to have a single particle trapped in 2D. So here's our, I'll draw this, x, y, and it's going to be trapped within the unit circle. So we're going to put an infinite potential around the unit circle. So it's, it can't go out here. Out here, it's, it's, it's forbidden. Okay, but within the unit circle, it's still got a potential, sort of parabolic potential. Uh, which if I did the cross-section in one dimension, it would look like this. Okay, this is u versus x, but there's also u versus y, which is the same thing. And this is our potential. You can see it's very, very large. This is t, t is the temperature here. Um, at, at Everywhere except the origin. So it really confines the particle down near here, but the particle is allowed to vary a, a little bit around. But because there's 50 here, and because we're going to do an exponential of that divided by kVt, you can see this function here, in the petition function, is very, very, very sharply peaked at the origin. If you go anywhere away from the origin, it's, it dies fast. So if we're trying to calculate the configurational part of the petition function, 
As you know from your earlier courses, you would have to calculate z like that. So we're going to calculate that integral over the unit circle. So over the unit circle here. Okay. So how do we do this? Well, we could use brute uh, force integration um, by dividing the thing into a whole of little squares. Let's do some little squares here. Uh, and um, and then adding up all the squares for this integral, put, make this integral over, over each square, uh, adding up all the squares, and we get some answer. Okay, But because the integral is dominated by a region very close to the origin, very close to here, um, we would need to have an enormous number of little squares to get an accurate answer, because most of our most of our squares would just contribute nothing. Okay. Now uh, we can use Monte Carlo here, um, and we could weight each shot by this exponential function. So imagine we're just shooting randomly here, and then so you know, shoot, 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 shoot. shoot. Um, but again, we're going to have the same problem. Most of our shots sample this guy here in a region which is where it's basically zero, x but minus 50, uh, it's almost zero. And the bits around the origin which really contribute to the integral will be ignored. Okay, so most of our shots don't count for very much. Okay, so the this mon brute force using, using little squares or shooting randomly and sampling doesn't work very well here. We just, you know, we, we've lost, okay? We're, not, we're never gonna get uh, anything very efficient. So what do we do? Well, we do what's called Metropolis Monte Carlo. This is one of the first methods, or maybe probably the first for system evaluating things by stack neck. Um, and um, it doesn't always work fantastically well as we will see, but it does guarantee, uh, in many cases, uh, a fairly efficient way of calculating the configurations of a system with the correct Boltzmann distribution. And if we get the correct Boltzmann distribution, we actually have all the information we want to about our system. Okay, It requires very little memory, only one state needs to be stored at a time. Uh, and we're going to try and do here uh, a very first simple example. We're going to have a particle in one dimension in a parabolic well. It's got half, half, kx, k hook, x squared, so that's our potential. This is x, uh, and the particle's you know sitting you know in this well somewhere. Okay, obviously it's sitting mainly down the bottom at, at low temperatures, but you can explore. Okay, and you want to you know when you're doing stat make when you're calculating the position function, uh, you will know you have to calculate the position x, the state. So the state is what we want to calculate, and that's specified by the position, um, and the energy of that state in this case u of x is given by this thing. Okay, just a parabolic potential. Okay, so how do we do this? Right. So I'm going to tell you what the algorithm is. I'm not going to prove to you what the algorithm is. I'm going to prove it. You can read the textbook, and there's a, a proof of it in the, in the textbook. What's important is not the proof. What's important is the actual methodology. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we have our particle in a well. Let me draw the well here again. Here's u, here's x. And we start it off in some random state. At the moment, we don't care about where we started off. I'm going to start it here. Okay? And this position we call x good. That's where we are at the moment. Okay? Now, I've just chosen a random state. And then I choose a new random trial state. Now, this, um, this trial state you can get in innumerable different ways. Okay? Um, I could just choose it at random, anywhere around here. Or, more typically, what you do is you take your initial state and you just shift randomly um, a distance r away. And where r might be chosen uh, from a uniform distribution of minus a to a. So we're going to choose, you know, minus 0.1 to 0.1. Somewhere in that just that region will choose our r. So we just add to x uh, a new, uh, a random variable r, a random number, uh, to get a new x. Okay, so here's x good. Here's our new x, x new. Okay, that's a trial state. Okay. And then we look at what happened to the energy. Okay, so we calculate du, which is the energy of the new state minus the energy of our old state, this new trial state, we'll call it. And this is the energy of our old state here. Okay. If the energy goes downhill or goes just across, we accept the new state. So if our energy change du is less than zero or equal to zero, we accept our new state. 
and then we say, right, our new state x good is equal to x new, and we just go back here and repeat. Go back here. No, let me choose another one, etc., etc. We keep, we keep, we keep going back around and around and around. So we just, we just go ooh, like this, okay? Um, provided we're always going downhill, okay? Of course, sometimes, like just here, obviously, if I choose that as my new state, I'm going uphill in energy, okay? Now, if we go uphill in energy, things are not lost, okay? What we do in that case is we don't automatically accept our new state. What we do is we generate, uh, we calculate this number here, Q, which is the exponential of the energy change minus the energy change divided by KBT. Okay, that's the first thing we calculate. All right. Now, by by definition, that's going to be less than one. If you tell me between zero and one, Q will be. Okay. Um, and then we also calculate a random number R uniformly distributed on zero to one. That means uniformly distributed means it's got equal chance of being 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.13. Doesn't matter where it is. It's got equal chance of generating any of those any of those numbers between zero and one. Now, if our R is less than Q, okay, we accept the new state so that X good is equal to X new. So, so we, if we've gone up here and we happen to generate uh, an R which is less than Q, then we accept our new state, okay? And then we go back, back to one and repeat, okay? If R is bigger than or equal to Q, we reject the new state. So we've gone uphill, and we found we've just gone uphill too much, um, uh, and we were going to reject that new state and leave x good as it is. Okay, so we keep our new state as x good, and then we go back and repeat. Okay, so we keep the algorithm going. So, what does this algorithm do? Okay, so let, let's let's uh, let's summarize it. Okay, so the first thing it does is you have to start start with a state. You pick a new state, which might be that one. If that new state actually goes downhill in energy, suppose I took the new state to be there, go downhill in energy, then of course we accept it, okay? And we keep going. If it goes uphill in energy, what we do is we calculate the Boltzmann factor of how much we've gone uphill, uh, and that's a number Q. And if that number Q, um, well that number Q is always between zero and one, and then we generate a random number between zero and one, and if R is less than Q, then we still accept the thing. Okay, so imagine a situation where Q, for instance, is, say, 0 0.9, which would mean we're not going uphill very much, okay? Then the chances are that our round number R, which we're generating, which might be 0 0.1 or 0 0.2, is going to be less than 0 0.9, and so we'll accept it, okay? However, in the case where Q, uh, we go uphill a lot, suppose this DU on KBT is, is 10,000, then Q itself will be a tiny number, an exponential of... You know, minus 10,000, okay? Um, and then the chances that our round number R will actually be less than that are very, very small indeed, and we won't go uphill. Well, the chances are we won't go uphill. So basically, your chances of going, if you're going downhill, it's fine. If you're going uphill, it can also be fine, but if you're going uphill energy a lot, then your move will be rejected, and you'll stay where you are. Basically, it says... Um, stay stay here. Okay, so let's let's actually implement that. It's a very simple algorithm. It's really really simple when you try and do it. Um, let's look at what happens. Okay, so we're going to end up with a sequence of uh, x goods. Oh, this should be really x goods. X good. Okay. All right. And the sequence of x goods we might get are. Uh, 1.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, minus 0.1. Okay, let's try those. Okay, that's the sequence we might generate from this. Okay, um, if we go downhill energy, uh, downhill energy when it's close to the origin, we always accept the move. So if we like this one, this one goes downhill, this one's going downhill, this one's going down, downhill, um, we always accept it. However, here, between here and here, we probably tried to go uphill. We might have gone tried to go to 0.6 or something. And the system said, no, um, you know, that's very unlikely. We'll keep 0.2. And here we might have tried to go uphill again to something, 0.7. Still rejected. Here we tried to go uphill and we didn't go uphill that much and it was accepted. So we went to 0.5. So we got a sequence 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0.5, etc., etc., etc. So sometimes we're allowed to go uphill. Okay? And uh, you can prove that this sequence, uh, if you do it enough, 
will reproduce the Boltzmann distribution, i.e. they are the sequence of x's we get are taken from the Boltzmann distribution. Okay, and therefore, if we want to say the average value of the x squared in this system, we just you know basically take the squares of all the x's here and divide by the number of x's we have, which in this case is ten. Uh, and we get a, an estimate of what the average value of x squared is for this system. Um, now, of course, in a real system, um, we're going to have more than you know, a real simulation will have more than ten iterations. We might have ten to the ten to the you know ten to the six iterations at least. Okay, um, but uh, this is the way it works. Okay. Um, now, in our sequence, the thing to note is a rejected new state does not appear. So here, for example, when we went from Point two to point two, there might have been uh, there would would have been a rejected state here. We would tried to go up to point seven, it doesn't appear. Okay, so the old good state is repeated rather than the rejected state. So that's that's an important thing to remember. Okay, so um, how do we calculate averages here? If I go back to here, you will see that it looks like I have. Um, kept all the different x's ding, 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 all the way along here okay but you don't need to do that and in fact you can't do that generally because there are memory problems so if i have a system which has uh end of the three spins uh n might be well a thousand or a hundred or something and i have to keep all those spins all the time uh for each each iteration my memory would rapidly run out okay um but you don't need to do that because uh, you can keep what's called a running average. Okay, so suppose you have done, gone through n iterations, and the average of some quantity a, it might be the average of a of x squared, the average of x to the fourth, the average of a of sine x, or something weird, doesn't matter. Um, the average value of a is currently a average like that, and then the next iteration you generate a new a new value for a. This is our new value for a. Then the new average you can figure out very quickly is just n times the old value of the average value of a plus a divided by n plus 1. So that's a, that's a running average. Okay, and that's very important that in Metropolis Monte Carlo you can do that. You don't need to keep all of the iterations. You just need to measure certain things and keep the average of those, and that means your memory usage is kept down to an absolute minimum. Okay, because most of these systems are, have very large numbers of particles, and even just... just Keeping one configuration of the system is already quite expensive in memory, let alone keeping every one you've ever, ever generated. Okay, so um, let's do a Python example of this. Okay, how does it work in practice? And we're going to do a very, very simple system. Uh, a single spin. The spin has uh, a down energy of minus 1 and an up energy of plus 1. Okay, it's just a simple spin. That's its energy if it's in the down state, that's energy if it's in the, in the up state, it's that one. Down state is that one. Um, and of course, it, at low temperatures, it would prefer to be in the down state. Okay, because the energy is, is minimized. Okay, so what do we look at? Okay. So, here's our Python code for a single spin. Uh, this is a, the first bit of the program. Um, you first have to import um, various you know, numerical things for plotting and, and doing numerical... Um, uh, numerical kinds of uh, configuration, numerical kinds of actions on, on the data. Um, your random number generator here, for example, um, you might want to import other, other, other things as well. This is just importing various, various parts of the thing you might use. Okay, so the, the really important part here is, well, there are two important parts. One of them is just to define the energy of our system. Remember, we need ultimately to calculate what du is in this system. Um, and we're going to say, well, if the spin is minus 1, remember, the energy is minus 1, which is this. If the spin is 1, which is the other, and the other alternative, uh, the energy is plus 1. So this is our, our subroutine our function, uh, which is defining how the energy depends upon the spin. And we return the energy. Okay, that's the very simplest bit. Um, and then we might want to set up our... Um, our code, so we're going to say we're going to have 20 attempts, we're going to do 20 durations only, our temperature is going to be 0.2, uh, we're going to set up a random seed here, we set up a random speed like that, uh, the point of this random seed thing is, um, if you set up a random seed, then you can get a, uh, a reproducible set of random numbers, which is useful when you're, when you're debugging, okay, 
we're going to set up the initial spin. The initial spin should actually be not spin one, but spin something else, because we can't have spin, spin, spin zero. It must be plus, must be plus or minus one, so that's a mistake. Okay, and we're going to store our spins and store our number of attempts in those sort of arrays. Okay, so um, let's uh, let's have a go at doing this. Um, if the spin, uh, and here's, here's the Monte Carlo part, here's the Metropolis Monte Carlo part. If the spin is minus one, if our current spin state is minus one, our new state will be the opposite, which is one. Uh, and if our spin is in state one, our new state will be minus one. So we're, we're just, our, 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 our argument is going to try and flip the spin all the time. We're trying, trying to flip. If we're in this state, we flip our new trial state will be that one. If we're in this one, our new trial state will be that one. So we just, instead of moving system, all we just to do is just flip the spin. Okay. So um, let's uh, calculate the energy change. The energy change is just the spin energy of the trial spin minus spin energy of our current good state, our spin our current energy. Okay, so that's the difference. If the energy change is less than or equal to zero, we keep our new spin. So there we go, spin equals trial spin. So if we've gone downhill in energy or across in energy, we keep our new spin. Otherwise, what do we do? Well, we generate a random number between zero and one, okay? And then we test if our number is less than the exponential of minus the energy change divided by kt. And if that's the case, our spin, uh, we accept it. If the above code fails, then we keep our spins unchanged. So this, this is the metropolis, and this is the Monte Carlo part. That's the metropolis part, okay? All right. Uh, and then what we're going to do now is we're going to... Uh, append our uh, list of spins and our, our, our number of trials here. Um, this, of course, here in this system, I'm actually going to keep all of the spins. So I'm going to keep a record of every spin I make uh, and uh, and when it was made, in some sense, when it, when it, was, when it was made. So I've got, a, I've got a history here, just for the, just for the point of view of, of plotting some graphs. Okay, Then I'm going to plot some graphs like this. Okay, And here's the data. Okay, Here's what we get. Now, the Python output looks like this. The temperature is really low. So 0.1 is actually fairly much less than, than 1. That's a spin energy. Um, what you find is, of course, the system is, is cold, and it tends to sit in the lowest energy state. Okay, the system is a little cold. And so we get a system which basically, as a function of time, it just sits in the ground state. Okay, it stays pointing down, which has the lowest energy. So when we when we try and flip it up, we can try and flip it up, but the system the, the system says, well, I'm sorry, but that's that jump is just too high most of the time. Okay, if we wait long enough, we will find it flipping up. If we wait for this is only forty attempts. If we waited for forty million attempts, we would certainly find it flipping up sometimes. But um, here we've only waited forty attempts and it doesn't flip up. Okay, let's take our temperature up a little bit more. Okay. So when we have a temperature up a little bit more, what we find is it sits in the ground state most of the time. So most of the time it's pointing down, but sometimes it points up, okay? And of course, as soon as it points up, we flip the spin again and it points down. So it only points up for one, one iteration because as soon as you flip the spin down, it's in a lower energy state. So what we find is we find a whole lot of sequences. A sequence of spins looks like this. It's down, 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 up, down, then down, 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 up, maybe, okay? Right, now you should be able to guess what happens if I then increase the temperature a lot more. So let's increase the temperature a lot more. And what you will find is because now it's really, really hot um, to 100, okay, um, what you find is it sits basically in both states equally likely, more or less, very, very close to equally likely. So when we flip it from spin down to spin up, it accepts it. because Not because it's going downhill, it's still going uphill. Delta U is bigger than zero for that, that, that thing. But the exponential of minus du on kBt is roughly the exponential of, uh, what would it be? Zero, which is one. And then we generate our random number r. So r must be less than one, but r is almost always less than one, uh, pretty much. And so um, what you find is it's this move to flip it up is always accepted. And of course, the move to flip it down, down to here, is also always accepted because it's going downhill energy. But these moves up here are almost always accepted. So it's spending almost all its time equally in both um, in both kinds of uh, states. Okay. Now, um, we'll just finish off briefly by saying, you know, what the hell's going on here in terms of thermodynamics? What's happening here? Well, 
The way to think about this is the system is trying to minimise its free energy. F is equal to U minus temperature times entropy. Okay. Now, if the temperature is low, as it was way back here, temperature's low in this slide, right? Let's go here. Um, then the entropy is actually doesn't matter much because it's multiplied by the temperature, which is small. So at low temperatures, we're just minimising U. And if we want to minimise U, of course, it sits in the ground state. Okay. Now, as the temperature is increased, what happens is the entropy starts to become more important because it's multiplied by the temperature. Okay. And then the system gets a little bit confused. It wants to minimise F. Okay. Now, it can minimise F by minimising U, but it, it's got this extra bit now which it has to take account of. Okay. And so as you increase the temperature, what it does is it starts to explore the spin space a bit more. So it's no longer prevented from occasionally going up. Okay, it'll occasionally spin up because uh, that increases entropy. It's, 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 it's disorder, it's, its ability to explore space. Uh, and therefore, we have a system which um, actually, you know, can actually explore things and... and and basically what that means is it's going um, occasionally showing up spins as well as down spins. And if you increase the temperature crazily, like here to 100, then what happens is U itself becomes negligible compared to this term here, uh, compared to the entropic term multiplied by the temperature. And then what happens is disorder takes over totally. And in that kind of scenario, what you find is it's spending half its time in the, in the ground state and half its time in the exciter state. Uh, and as far as it's concerned, there's no real difference between them. Okay. So this is what the Monte Carlo, Metropolis Monte Carlo system uh, algorithm is doing. It's saying we want to minimize F equals U minus TS. And the bit that says go downhill, if you can go downhill, minimizes that. And the other bit which says go uphill sometimes is trying to help minimize this. Okay, trying to, trying to, trying to make, make sure that also contributes. So that if you want to understand what the Metropolis Monte Carlo system algorithm is doing, it's doing those two things in a sort of hand-waving way. The first one is minimizing U. The other one where you go uphill occasionally is actually allowing the system to access all kinds of other states uh, and therefore access, um, access more entropy. Okay, and that's where we'll end